This is uh, a program that, that was not started by me. It started 10,000 years ago by the people, uh, indigenous people of this, of this land. And it's always been a value to feed our kids, you know, feed the kids. It's, you don't need metrics and, and, uh, and, and uh, numbers to, to prove that we need to feed our kids nutrient-dense food and keep them healthy, right? With all of the colonial baggage, we've got a lot of brokenness, and in that we need to work together to come up with ways that, that we can stand in both worlds. Because, um, so, learning Cree, being an English speaker is very difficult because it's my go-to language, but the Cree language has to be continued, but we're also working in an English world. But we call our program the Natak Mitsiwin, which is uh, like a universal, many different foods, universal school food strategy. So, in Cree, universal school food strategy is Nanatak Mitsiwin. Mitsiwin is food. And Nanatak is a multiple different universal kind of idea. We have a buffalo herd for the schools, and they just shoot the buffalo, bring it to the school, drop it off. It's still breathing almost, and it's kind of still got air in its lungs, you know. And who does the, like this part? Community members. And then the students are all standing around watching and helping. You know, it's really kind of, it's not... Uh, it's not uh, a lot of rules or anything involved. It's just come out and watch, you know. Yes, we used all the meat. In the school food program, no. <laughs> not yet. We can't, we can't use it in the school food program. But we did distribute it to the families in the community, uh, the, the school families in the community. We do that every fall. So, um, on, uh, we go, we, our, our Cree uh, department uh, does a... Uh, um, uh, Nehiawatso in um, land-based learning, uh, and and in that they they do duck soup and they it all happens under the radar. So that is consumed by students, but that's it's you know you can't. There are traditional ways of knowing. There's there's food so indigenous food sovereignty that has been declared a food declaration, a sovereignty declaration that has been declared by the chiefs and signed off. So it's really. No colonial powers can, uh, can touch that on the reserve, you know. But we can't use the food in the school food program. No, no we, can't, we can't use it on a daily basis in the school food. We do have access to elk and, and bison, but it's farmed, and then it's, you know, it's properly, or not properly, but according to health regulations, processed, and we got the authorities signing off on it. So if you don't know where Muscochise is, it's central Alberta, so Edmonton's up here. Muscochise is about... 50 kilometers south. Um, it's comprised of four nations, Louisville, Montana, Samson, and Ermanskin. And they all meet in the town site of Muscochis, formerly known as some Dutch guy that nobody cares about. Um, the original treaty land, like reserve land, was actually a, a horseback ride between Bittern Lake, Pigeon Lake, south to Gull Lake, and over to Red Deer Lake, which is a lot larger hunk of land than we currently have, but it was eaten away in the years after the treaties were signed. We have uh, 13,000 band members in all four nations, approximately, and we are growing rapidly, so a lot of people coming back home and bringing skills and knowledge back to the community. Um, we have some really cool people on staff, uh, Steve Wood, our Cree instructor, uh, the lead drummer and singer for Northern Cree. He's awesome. He's one of our Cree teachers. Uh, but we have 2,400 students currently, 2,450 students. Uh, we have an estimated we're going to have another 200 students next fall. At the kindergarten level, like right now in kindergarten, we have, in all four nations, we have about 450 kids in kindergarten. So we are, have a population explosion going on, <laughs> which is great. Yeah, but they're, they're kids that need to be fed and fed well. So um, I was recently at an Indigenous Solutions Lab for Diabetes Prevention in Ottawa, which is why this slide's here, and I left it here. I took out some other irrelevant slides, but I think this is relevant if you don't know already that the diabetes across Canada in all communities is, is, um, is on the rise. And diabetes prevalence in First Nations communities is substantially higher on average, especially northern communities and communities that are remote. Uh, we're not remote. So ours in Muscochis is about 12%, which is um, somewhere lower than the national average. But 
Garden Hill First Nation in Manitoba, who we, who we work with, or um, Red Earth Creek in northern Alberta, who we also work with, uh, they have a much higher prevalence of diabetes, especially up at Garden Hill. It's one of the <coughs> biggest things that they're concerned about right now, so is lowering the diabetes. And school food programs are identified as diabetes prevention tools, uh, one of many, because diabetes is very complex. But it's more about a community paradigm shift than it is about any particular program. But the complexity of the issue is reflected in recent research by Alberta uh, Richard T. Oster. He works for uh, U of A and he does a lot of leading work in diabetes prevention. High rates of diabetes among Aboriginal communities can be strongly linked to declining knowledge of Indigenous languages. So we need, you know, we need a, a very multi-pronged approach in preventing diet-related illnesses. Um, lowering the prevalence of those. So it's not just about school food programs. And if it was just about school food programs, we have no evidence to support that. It's just we have an instinctual understanding that feeding kids is good. And it is. Healthy school food alone is not a panacea to solving all of our diet-related illnesses. Um, evidence to prove that school food programs are effective at preventing diabetes or any diet-related illness is lacking. However, uh, metrics are not necessary. I don't think they are, I don't believe they are because we have an intrinsic knowledge as, like as a parent, I want to feed my kids healthy food, nutri nutrient dense food. As a community of humans, right, uh, we have an intrinsic knowledge that feeding our children nutrient dense food is good for the survival and happiness of civilization. Right? We don't need metrics to say that it's important to, to feed our kids healthy food. We just know. Yeah. I was in Ottawa and with these doctors and researchers and they said, well, the metrics aren't there to sell it to investors. Well, you know, we don't really need to sell anything. We're, we're giving the kids healthy, nutrient-dense food and that's an explanation in itself. You know. In the beginning, um, when I first started with this particular school authority, it was Mio Wokoto and Education Authority. Mio Wokoto means good kinship in Cree, so kinship education. Um, it was a community-based, uh, independent education authority. Uh, that means that it wasn't band controlled. It was one of the four nations that was not band operated, and it um, had about 10 years um, independent from the band experience before I came on board. So there was, how that structure is, is it goes INAC funding directly to the, the superintendent of schools who is reports to the board. That's different from most other um, indigenous communities in Canada where there's INAC funding going to the band and then through the band filter and then to the, to the board and the, and the superintendent. So we had a lot more freedom with um, how we felt or how the community felt that money. I'm just a tool. So um, <laughs> we had a lot more freedom in that community to, um, to place that money where the community actually wanted the money, right? Because the board members were elected um, people in the community that were valued as the, for their knowledge and Inatsuin, uh, Inatsuin, their wisdom. Um, so we believe that um, children learn what they live. If you're exposed to violence, then, then you'll be continuing that violence or you're exposed to uh, unhealthy eating patterns, you're gonna continue that in your, in your adulthood. So um, meeting the basic physiological needs of children is foundational to this goal of, of having healthy children. Uh, daily exposure to healthy foods is important. If you're exposed to ads of, or, or images of marketing of Coke and Pepsi and, and chips and pop, if that's what you're exposed to every day, you're gonna think that's normal, right? If you're exposed to McDonald's food, fast food every day or whatever, you're going to be, that's normal food. That's what good food is. And home cooked food is not so good because you don't get it much. You know, it's, you normalize what you see every day. So daily exposure is important. Eating together in a community is important. The kids eating together, coming out of their classrooms and meeting in a gathering area is a value. You know, uh, sitting with the teachers and the support staff and the janitors, everybody having access to the school food program. That's all part of the Nanatok Mitsuin vision that everybody has access to the school food. Um, and then, of course, where uh, Scott was ta talking about is opportunities to develop culinary skills, growing food, and learning about proper nutrition. That's the educational component. So, 
Scott touched on, there's a great amount of wisdom in what Scott was talking about with um, building champions and, and that's what we need. So I have lots of conversations with people about the importance of having a champion in the schools. We don't have a lot of champions. We have a, a shortage of, of champions. We have sh a shortage of teachers that want to do what Scott and I do. We need more champions, right? So um, building champions starts in education, inspiring greatness, you know. And on a daily basis, we have our high school students in the kitchen, just like Scott does. And what he went over is like uh, it's a kitchen environment, and you're you're you have a deadline every day. It's a different way of of implementing curriculum than conventional <coughs> education models, right? Um, conventional education models are. Um, are designed and marketed to intellects, people that are going to go to university. You know, the vast majority of our students aren't going to go to university. Not that that's a bad thing at all, you know, which in the past, it's sort of, if you don't make it into university, then you get to do the secondary stuff, you know. So what we want to do is place value on, on, other, on other career options. There is, like, you know, um, and different learning, different ways of learning. You know, most people, I think, you know, don't learn well sitting in a classroom listening to somebody talk like I'm doing right now. You, you can explain the rules, but you're not going to get it unless you play. So if you go to a hand game tournament, nobody's going to be giving you a rule book and sitting you down and <laughs> these are the rules. You're going to be expected to play and you're going to learn as you go and you're gonna, they're going to take your money as you lose, <laughs> you know. Um, <laughs> and then, so, so that... This, and our students, they learn, like all students, like my wife's a teacher in the public system in the task one. Her student, her music program is very project-based as mine is uh, project-based. Um, like goal-oriented, success-oriented. It's a different style of educational implementation of, of curriculum. One in six children live in food and secure households. And uh, equal access to education means equal access to food services. Where if you have emergency lunch programs or targeted school food programs, you're always going to have disparity in the lunchroom. So you're going to have people who come to the, to the cafeteria and they're going to be lining up to the emergency lunch program. Or they're going to go to the special room where the, where the poor kids eat or whatever. You know. um, and that plays out in every high school across Canada where you have the, the multi-tiered access to lunch. So in our community especially, we did not want to propagate that sort of disparity in the lunchroom as we saw play out. So we wanted to eliminate all of those barriers and have a universal school food strategy, right? Makes sense. Um, that's where the coalition came in and building up the, um, the backbone, the policy backbone. And I'll show you on, the web, on our website where we kind of did a, uh, uh, quick hits of the policy that we have for our school. Uh, vision to meet the essential nut nutritional needs of all students from K to 12, celebrate Nahiao culture and values through food, and facilitate career learning pathways of culinary students. So the celebrating traditional Nahiao culture, like we have feasts uh, all the time. We have special days throughout the year we have, where we have people come in the school and work with the kids. Um, and I just kind of step back um, when I was teaching. I'm not teaching anymore, uh, kind of am still, but um, when I was in the classroom, we'd have these ladies come in and they would make all the food and they would work with the kids and i just kind of hover around and make sure all the equipment works. Um, so bringing in community members and then serving the community in, in different ways. We have a great partnership with Urban Skin Community Development and we do stuff for them like um, every, on a monthly basis. We open up the school facilities, they do, like we have a barbecue next week. We have uh, we do catering events for their grief workshops or whatever. We do a lot of catering in the community. We hire the students to come in and do that, right? So we're building community through the school facilities, but also through providing services, our our culinary services, right? So we do outside catering events all the time. Um, we build community relationships through locally sourced food. Uh, 90% of our protein comes from the Hutterite colony, which is just northeast of us. The closest you can get to bison meat, this grass-fed beef, right? Um, and it's because it's not on the grain-fed program, we've been able to avoid all of the fluctuations in the market. We've been at $9 a kilogram since 2013. So um, we get chicken, pork from them as well. Um, 
So we, we apples from Stephen Dan's Fresh Fruit. You might know them as Soto Farms in Calgary here or over there. So we get like 3,000 pounds of apples from them a week that we go through. And we're at just under a dollar a day, uh, or a dollar a pound for apples from, from Steve. You, you can buy them cheaper from, from wholesalers like H&W Produce, where we get our, a lot of other produce. But Steve and Dan are like a local family operated. They have a lot of um, similar values that, that we have about giving back to the land, giving back to farmers. You know, um, we don't want to just rob farmers and get the cheapest possible produce, you know, even though like I'm, I kind of look at the numbers going, why wouldn't I buy apples for 50 cents when I come or, you know, uh, but we want to support community members. We want to invest in them and build good relationships with outside businesses and farmers. S4 greenhouses in Lacombe, uh, we get all of our tomatoes, cucumbers, peppers, and lettuce, a lot of our lettuce, not all of our lettuce, we go through a lot of lettuce, um, but all of our tomatoes, all of our cucumbers, all of our peppers come from the Lacombe greenhouses, and they, they provide us like a lot of, of vegetables, a lot of vegetables. Um, and it's all really beautiful stuff, high quality stuff. They sell it at the Strathcona Farmer's Market for like, you know, three bucks a pound or something, because it's so beautiful. And then they, they give it to us for a really good deal, because I wrote them a check for like $24,000 last year, and we haven't even, we, I think we've gone through close to half of it. So um, they give us a really good price. They just kind of give us everything. We, have, we use plastic reusable crates. And so there's no, there's no cardboard costs for them. And they just, they always have surplus and vegetables from their markets or whatever. They just throw them into the bins and we, we cart them away in our trucks. Um, so with having those positive uh, relationships, we're invested in each other. As community partners, we're invested in each other, and we have a um, we can we can, it's positive impact on our budget, right? So we have uh, we can save money, we can invest in local businesses, and they're invested in our survival and continuance, and we're invested in their survival and continuance. So when Pine Haven was thrown under the bus last year for the E. coli outbreak, we were like, no, next week we need three thousand dollars worth of meat, you know. And well, everybody was like, oh, all right, it's this, that, you know, murmur, murmur, murmur. And it was all over CBC, I don't know if you remember it, but they were just thrown under the bus as the Hutterite colony that poisoned people with E. coli. It was, you know, it's more complex than what was made out to be. But So we're invested in our local businesses. We want to support them. We also want to support families. Absolutely, that's what we do. By having a universal school food program, we're saving our local families like thousands of dollars a year in groceries for crap food that they would have bought from the grocery store. Because nobody has time anymore. That's what Debbie was talking about too, is the changing nature of our society. Working parents, uh, dual income families, single parent families, um, multiple different situations where nobody has time to make food for their kids. That's healthy, nutrient dense, right? And my kids go to public school and I struggle on a weekly basis to have healthy food packed in their lunch boxes. My youngest son goes to an elementary school where he has one minute at the microwave. They're only given, so we don't use microwave food, so it's like a sandwich, or it's like cheese and crackers and, and sausages that I do at home myself. Um, or I make wraps on Sunday if I'm not too tired, but oftentimes I'm throwing packaged stuff into my kids' lunch boxes, and that's me, you know, and I'm very, knowledgeable about this stuff and how important it is but i tired and i've got a lot of stuff to do and and that's everybody across canada and we have no support in our in our in our schools for for nutri nutrition in the schools so we want to support the families and you know we make food better in our school with our students than families can hope to do for their kids and we do it for cheaper so we're saving money but we're investing in local businesses we're saving families money it's a win-win-win for every conservative in, in the country, right? Um, and we're building community food security by investing in our local businesses, local people, and planting gardens and growing, you know, um, food forests and, and planning for, like we're in the planning stages of this stuff. Like we started last year a food forest. It's got to be like when the snow stops coming and the ground defrosts, we're going to be putting more trees in the ground, maybe in a few weeks, but um, so the, it builds the necessity for that, right? So we have, like, before we had the school food program, why would we have greenhouses? 
doesn't make any sense. Who's going to, who's, where's the food going to go? Right? It's just a mechanism. You need a school food program to effectively distribute the food that you get from greenhouses. You just have, oh, greenhouse is a great idea, a really cool idea. You're going to produce a bunch of food, but where is it going to go? If you don't have a school food program, you could give it to the food bank or like, you can distribute it through a, a box program or something, but those are not effective means of food distribution. Schools are identified as the most effective means of, of distribution of food in the community. We started in Muskogee's before I got there. Um, in 1996 to 2006, Ermanskin, uh, so we'll just talk about Ermanskin for now, but uh, Ermanskin schools had no access to nutritionally dense food um, at all. So from 2006 to 2012, the community decided, hey, you know, it would be a good idea to feed our kids somehow. So there was all sorts of initiatives like ad hoc, this and that, like toasts and whatever programs and ramen noodles. And um, like we had a Chinese food restaurant in town that brought rice and ribs. We had um, like a pizza place in Pinoca that once a week brought up pizzas and then we just, but we sold all that stuff. And then for the emergency lunches, we maybe had some muffins that were brought by a teacher from Costco for maybe a half a dozen kids or something, <laughs> you know, it was, it was just, it, it just, there was no funding. There wasn't a priority. Um, it was just an idea that, Hey, we need to feed our kids. In 2013, um, they, like I started that year and, uh, it, it all started in a conversation I had with Brian Wildcat when I was living in Thailand, and he's like, we need somebody to come in and, and teach foods, but it's not just a foods program. Like, we want a community-based school food program for all the kids. And I was like, well, what kind of equipment do you have? And he said, we have a fully stocked commercial kitchen. It's never been used, really. <laughs> you know? it was, the school was built in 1996, the high school, and the kitchen wasn't used effectively until I got there at all by anybody. They had steam kettles, they had a skillet, they had convection ovens, steamers, and workspace, a walk-in cooler, uh, dry storage, and it wasn't, it wasn't used. There was, the only piece of equipment that was used was the food warmer when they brought rice and ribs from Howie's. Yeah. <laughs> and then they sold them for five bucks a thing. So, you know, the kids that could afford the rice and ribs were like, you know, the rich kids and the kids that couldn't were starving or eating ramen noodles in the, in the emergency lunch line. So in 2013, we started a universal school food strategy at Ermanskin Junior Senior High School for 300 kids. That year, we fed 300 kids. We moved all the high school food students out of... So I just hit the ground running with the idea. I spent the summer planning and then just was like, okay, September, whatever, first or uh, August 26th, first day of school. Everybody in the kitchen, we're not in home ec anymore. That class... At home ec classes for the Cree room now, they're going to make bannock and stuff and there's going to be, okay, duck soup, whatever. And uh, we're all going to the kitchen and managed to get some aprons and just kind of had a vision of what it should look like. But I had my first year, I had a bunch of grade 12s that were kind of thugs, you know, and they were like, had a big pizza knife and they're like hacking the table, you know, <laughs> with this piece. They were doing silly things, you know. Um, and it was, it was the throwing meat at each other was something like, yeah, so it was, it was a gong show. The first year was a gong, but it was successful. We were able to get the food out every day and we had some helpers come in. Like we had, I had an EA who was like a big sister for a couple of the guys in the school and, and, uh, it was just able to, we were able to make it work for those 300 kids every day. And that we started right away. We did breakfast, lunch, and snacks. So we were making everything from scratch. We had, uh, that first year though, we were tied in still with Cisco and GFS. Um, and we, we had, so that first year, we were spending a huge amount of food. So we had $60,000 budgeted for 300 kids that year. And we blew our budget like two thirds of the way through the year. The following year, <coughs> um, we brought in another staff member. Um, I cut out GFS and Cisco efficiencies were made. And at the end of that year, I calculated after we, so it, right at the beginning of the year, I cut, I was like, don't call me anymore, GF, don't call me Cisco. We're, I'm going to jump in my little van and I, <laughs> I'm going to go to no frills 
and I'm gonna get all, that's where that picture was from, it was like carts of, of oranges that I got for 50 cents a pound or whatever from No Frills, I was super happy about it, you know. Um, and I'd go to No Frills and I'd buy stuff like twice, three times a week. And um, and then I started to build these, you know, well maybe I should go down to Wholesale Club you know, later in the year, and whatever. Um, we introduced salad bars partway through the year. Um, I saw them, I think something to do with Michelle Obama at some point, and I was like, yeah, let's do that, you know. Um, let's get them in the schools uh, because what it does is it gives students daily access to um, the visual of like exposure of, of healthy food. So the kids walk through the lunch line, get their hot portion, and they go through the salad bar, and it's daily exposure to healthy food that they wouldn't otherwise normally have that exposure. So that thing about seeing things on a daily basis becoming it educates the palate, right? And you're sitting in a lunchroom with all these kids from all these different grades, and you might be a marginalized kid, and you just kind of come from a rough home, and you don't really want to eat that, what's in the salad bar, so you might, maybe you grab a hot lunch, but you're just kind of like, eh, what is that? You just, you know. But you look across the room, and there's the cool kids in grade 12 who are eating broccoli salad. Well, a month later, you're gonna be eating broccoli salad too. So there's a subtle peer pressure that happens when you eat together, and you have daily access to the visual uh, exposure of, of healthy food, right? So the salad bars, we saw that happen in the first few weeks of getting the salad bars introduced. That we had a lot of waste in the first couple of weeks, and the, the, the people that we had uh, had hired for our kitchen staff were sort of like super skeptical. They were like the, the old shift in paradigm, right? So there's how school food is, is imagined to be by most people is like Archie comics and, and Simpsons or whatever. And it's like, that's school food. Well, it's based, you know, whatever uh, culture believes school food is. You know, the lunch lady, the angry lunch lady or whatever. Um, we, we did have angry lunch ladies. I still have angry lunch ladies <laughs> working for me. But it's, we're, we have to shift the paradigm. It's about a paradigm shift, right? Because if you don't, if you're stuck in that mentality, then it doesn't become a community thing. It's not sustainable. You're constantly putting energy into it. It's an open system. It's not a closed system. It's like a greenhouse. You want a closed system greenhouse. I don't know if you know about that stuff, but you want a closed system greenhouse to maximize energy use. When you have somebody who's like an angry lunch lady mentality, you're constantly putting energy in it to keep it alive. They're, everything's resting on their shoulders. But when you have a community thing with the students involved and the teachers involved and the principal and the parents are supportive and... Yeah, then you have um, then you have a much more sustainable program. But um, the first policy we implemented at the schools is eliminating marketing of unhealthy food to children. That meant the candy shop that is across the hall from, from the that's open every lunch because they make money for their travel club and they're selling like licorice and you know chocolate bars and crap. Yeah, and I, so I'd have two lunch lines uh, at lunch, um, and one was for the candy shop. <laughs> you know, and one was for our healthy food. And the kids would ultimately come back, but they wanted to get their candy first, some of them. So I just said, no more candy shop. We, I went to the principal and went to the superintendent of the schools. I was like, we can't be selling candy in the schools when I'm trying to, like, we're, when the goal is to feed the kids healthy. So get rid of the candy shop. And it was run by one of the teachers who, who was, kind of, was kind of her business, right? And that's what we're finding in a lot of the schools that we go into, is that these little programs are kind of like they're, Teachers, a little entrepreneurial, you know, like business. We're gonna sell sell this stuff, and I'm not sure where all that money went, all the profit. You know, you never know. There's a lot of there's a lot of dodgy things that happen, right? With selling stuff in schools to kids, a lot of a lot of tricky stuff. So we wanted to eliminate that completely. So we just I did a, got the principal to sign off on a policy that's just no marketing of unhealthy food to children in the schools. What that means is anything packaged, labeled, and marketed to, to kids. Anything, chips, pop, chocolate bars, whatever. Anything packaged, labeled. Bake sales, that was the question. It was like, well, what about bake sales? They're cookies, they're high insurance. Well, that's fine. I'm not gonna come in and like investigate everybody's little fundraiser thing and say, that's unhealthy, I'm not gonna do that. But we draw the line at marketing, I guess. 2014, 2015, so the following, this is our third year into it. Uh, Ermanskin Junior Senior High School Food Program implemented a successful transition to prepare and serve breakfast to an additional 425 students at the elementary school. So this third year into it, the board said, can you do what you're doing there, but over at the elementary school where we have almost triple the amount of students? 
um, or double the amount of students. And uh, I was like, yeah, but we need a we need a catering van, and we need a so we got an old 1998 uh, 17 passenger van, ripped all the seats out of it, and I bought some Cambro um, thermos boxes, like the Cambro holding boxes, and um, we make all the food at the high school, get the volume up, and we hired two more people that worked over at the elementary school, um, and we built a a program there and that in the beginning taking food from the high school delivering it to the elementary school figuring out a way to distribute it at lunchtime it was a challenge right because you have 425 kids we've got like 50 staff members over there we've got you know and everybody has an opinion about what food is and how it should be distributed and blah 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 right Everybody's got an opinion about food, which makes it difficult to on the on the in the logistical. Like, it's a great idea. I've got to feed the kids, but then when you go down, today we're feeding the kids, and everybody's like, ah, "I got an opinion," you know. <laughs> <clears throat> so we got to mitigate all of those things, right? When you're administrating this, because there's a lot of different emotions involved with food. So everybody's got to be positive and like supportive, and the principal's got to have your back, right? Is it as a as the school food champion. If, um, if there's shortfalls in any of those things, it can all come crashing down on you, right? Um, so it worked though, it worked, it worked. So working closely with staff, students, parents, having open communication and support from administration, we were able to modify our program to accommodate the additional numbers. So it worked. Um, we required health safety equipment at the schools. Uh, we brought in salad bars there. Um, we had to figure out a way to, we had to get dishwashers in there because 450 kids and we weren't going to use styrofoam or paper, like disposables. So we brought in dishwashers, commercial sinks. Uh, we outfitted the kitchen there to, um, to, to, to accommodate the, the washing and sanitizing of the dishes every day. And then we had to do menu, menu modifications for the little kids. So the little kids, like they're just, they're little and uh, they need simple things, you know. They eat, they eat simple things. doesn't mean it has to be macaroni and, and cheese or whatever, macaroni and hot dogs. But not, not that that's a bad thing once in a while, I'm saying. But uh, simple ingredients, right? Simple ingredients for little kids. Okay, next. That's our kitchen at Ermanskin. The following year, we expanded to the kindergarten. There's an additional 200 kids. Um, there's some students making danishes, which aren't necessarily healthy, but... Um, we included all the staff members up until this point. The staff wanted to eat, so we were charging them $3 a plate, and that was just convoluted and was causing lots of problems with money going missing. And, you know, I hate that thing about collecting money from people in schools because it goes missing, and then you got people services involved, and it's just a pain in the ass. So just give everybody free food. But the stipulation is that the teachers have to sit and eat with the kids. They can't just take the food and retreat to their classrooms, their little silos hide for the day. Um, they've got to sit with the kids and eat in the gathering area. So that was a stipulation. All the teachers eat for free, but they eat with the kids. We did that for a couple years, improved capacity. Um, it was very successful with the kids. They were really engaged at the food preparation level. And we began, uh, last year, we began to work with eight other schools in Muscogee's district as plans between four nations took shape to toward an amalgamation. February 28th, we received board, board approval to begin incremental implementation of school food strategies all across the 11 schools in Muscogee. So they said, this is what's happening for next fall. You better get started now. So um, that was February 2018 last year. Uh, and then July, uh, Muscogee Education Schools Commission took control of all of the schools in Muscogee. So that's Samson, Ermanskin, Louis Bull, Montana, Pigeon Lake, and... Uh, there was a lot of issues. So next, like those schools had a lot of challenges with getting food out. So different areas, different areas and, and they're all band run. Yeah. And they're all band run schools. We were the only one that was an independent school authority. They were all band run schools. So their funding was really lacking and, and, and funding allocated towards food was just basically non-existent. Um, so they were relying on donations or, the health, the local health service providing weekly 
vouchers for lucky dollar foods, you know, um, whatever. Um, so, uh, the Natak Mitsuin was founded, the, the name was changed, and the Natak Mitsuin we became a department in central services for Muskogee's Education Schools Commission. They said, you're the director, you've got 11 schools, how many cooks do you need? I said, oh, I did some calculations, I need 16 cooks, let's go. And um, we, um, at the high school level, still have, this, have the high school students involved in the preparation of the food. So we have two high schools, and uh, the high school students make the food. The middle schools that we have in the kindergartens, of, of course, they don't have much in the way of help with pre prepping the food. But um, the, 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 like the, the basic fundamental idea is there. That, that the you know that it has to be everybody involved in some way so the students help with cleaning or they help with serving um, building capacity within the ranks for leadership and innovation we finally got a good team after in our second year and they've been with me since the beginning so building leadership capacity in those guys um, like today they're just delivering food to all the 11 schools filling up their coolers tomorrow well actually they're in the warehouse today reorganizing the coolers tomorrow they're distributing food to all the schools so Sunday we go into all the schools fill up all the coolers Monday morning they have all the kitchens stocked up right so those guys are running that um, they were promoted within MESC so that it's 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 really good for the community members right so this is our approved budget for next year and uh, this is where we're at now so it, it all like it's a success based thing they, they wouldn't give us this money if if we didn't have the history of it working and in the agreement that our superintendent had with the federal government INAC and the provincial government um, the universal school food strategy was part of that agreement for funding so when we when we when they approach the government they they approach them with these numbers so from INAC we get a million 1.5 million for 2,400 kids. Um, this is for everything. This is for structural readiness and capital assets and employees and uh, food, uh, of course. The food, the food cost I have here is $550,000. So that's, the, that's just the food cost that they've approved for me for next year. Now in the beginning, on, this, on the individual school level, I only calculated the food cost at 72 cents a day because I would be teaching foods anyway and I would have probably have an EA in my class. So we didn't calculate in employment costs until, we only calculated in now because we're so massive when we've got 11 schools, so now we have to calculate what are our employee costs, right? Um, every individual school can make it work on that just calculating this, the food costs if they have the infrastructure already to make the food. Most schools don't have in Canada. But, um, We've got more schools being built in the province, and the previous government, uh, Bruce Hinckley, our MLA, assured me that in the next uh, round of construction for the schools, and they're building these schools, they they're have uh, priority is to you know have a kitchen, a commercial kitchen involved with the construction. So, yeah. So the um, what do we have here? We have um, the operational. So we have $80,000 here for contract fees, traditional foods. What does that mean? We're building a permaculture design, like food forest, and I'm not the man, actually Christian's the man that, that should probably inform you guys about how to do that at schools, because that's his expertise. And we can make it work, you know, as long as the community is bought in. So and that means teachers, principals, as support staff, parents, the board, you know, and it all have to believe that that's an important program.